or you can do them all to be more structural. So you have like life force gesture versus structural strokes. And it's often a combination of those two that make it feel right. Here we are, we're gonna go to here. So really it comes down to three things for me. Once I started seeing trees as basic shapes with a little bit of texture and some edge variety, it was like, oh, okay, like I can do that. Like I can scrub in a shape and a basic shape and then I can like give it a little bit of texture on the inside and then rough up the edge a little bit. And it looks a lot more like a tree than when I started just trying to paint every, every branch and every uh, leaf. The same way that when you go to paint a figure, right, or draw a figure, the second that you start drawing like every um, hair on their head, right, like it just doesn't work. Right. And then you have to, you have to step back and simplify it. So here's some ways that I have felt like I've been able to do that. Um, I think it really goes back to these early, early um, assignments that we had in school, right? Of painting a cube, of, of drawing a cube, drawing a sphere, drawing a, a cone or a cylinder, and then maybe some of the basic objects in that. Like it's students don't realize when they're being asked to do these assignments that they're really being asked to understand the fundamentals of everything they're ever gonna paint. Whether it's a figure or a tree, like understanding how to draw a sphere really is kind of the basic of that. So here's a little bit of what I mean <clears throat> by this. So here's my photo reference here. And then really these are just basic geometric lines, but it's not too much of a jump to go from that to something a little more painterly, if you want to call it that, or more organic or just more complex, right? And so thinking about the world in terms of basic shapes really is vital. But it's the same problem that we would have if we were painting a figure that just painting a basic shape doesn't make it informative. So here's some other thoughts about just not simplifying alone, like the, the little kind of blob here off to the left. That's simple. It has all the same colors, about the same number of, of edges and points, but it's not informing anything, right? So it's about understanding the structure of what you're really looking at and then using the simplification to inform what's going on. And therein lies a challenge, one of the big challenges actually, to your point of not knowing kind of different types of trees or the structure of trees. And so taking some time to understand how trees grow and things is important. Any questions up to this point, Eric, anything you would share or, or questions that you think would be helpful to answer? I'll I'll okay. hop in. I'll hop in when I have any. Okay, great. So here's a thought. We understand gesture really well when we're talking about figures, right? We say, okay, here I'm going to have my, my main shape and maybe I'll have an under shape there and then I'll have the midpoint of my figure and then going to come down. Maybe I'll start to make, you know, head over the top of that. We understand these basic shapes so well when we're talking about figures and how to do that. But then suddenly when we get to a tree, we, so that's the basic shape idea. Let's talk about gesture with a, with a figure. Let's say that's our spine, right? And then we have a line of action with every figure. So we have the, the figure there. We're, then we're going to build our figure around that spine that was giving that line of action. Mm -hmm. And then there's our, you know, our legs or whatever, but it all is based on that gesture of the motion and energy from that figure that we build it around. It's the same exact thing with trees. Trees have a gesture, clouds have a gesture, mountains have a gesture, every shape in nature has a gesture the same way that a figure has a gesture. They're just a lot more, they're, you know, they're not moving as quickly as we are. And so it's harder to see it sometimes. But if we look at, let's get this. If we look at this tree here, we've got this gesture 
obviously this this kind of energy pushing out from that tree and then we've also have we also have this basic shape that's coming down here we have this other kind of smaller tree right in front of it but i think it's important to say okay the gesture of this tree that i have this large arc of a semicircle and then i have these this kind of energy pushing out but it's not exactly symmetrical when if we were little kids and we were asked to draw a tree if i told my little kids to draw a tree they would say okay and we would make a pile of grapes and then make a little trunk at the bottom or if it was a pine tree we would say okay there's my pine tree and then we'd put the thing at the bottom we'd make yeah. them very these, symmetrical these are the shapes we spend our whole life overcoming exactly right because we have preconceived ideas because our teacher says oh draw a tree and this is how you draw a tree and so we just pattern that forever so coming to really break it down and say okay like this tree itself has let me just get a brighter color here similar to the other one has a big a big semicircle most trees do right because they are growing up and out and then there's a finite point at which gravity kind of overtakes and the and the kind of dna of the tree tells it to stop but yet i love how this has a big shape here or a small shape rather and then a big shape in the back and then it has all these kind of bits and it's really low where this other one over here really kind of pushed up and out where here we have a lot going on down at the bottom even right next to it here we have a really big gesture there and then a few of the, the branches. But I think trying to look at the outside of the tree, see what's going on, and then start to see this gesture. Even in this tree, you can see that there's probably a predominant wind that was blowing, let me get a darker color for you, that was blowing this way for most of the life of this tree so that it started to grow to where it was largely scalloping to the right even as it developed kind of a big or a small mass here, a bigger mass, and then some medium masses there. So if I'm thinking about the gesture of these trees, I'm going to say, okay, where's the main energy drawing from that I've got? The main energy is really pushing out this way. And then I'm going to have these big semicircles that I'm going to start to, to draw in. And then pretty quickly, I can start to establish the shape of that, that tree, right? So really starting to look at this tree as a series of big semicircles that all thrust out and to the right is really important. Here's another thought about gesture on a tree is that the same way that if I'm drawing a figure and I draw them in this way to where, let's say I have, <laughs> that's a really long neck. Let's say I have my figure there and my legs are coming up this way and there's the feet. I know that this figure is not standing on the ground, right? I know that they're like about to face plant, like gravity is going to take over and they're falling down. They're no longer on the ground. The same is true with a tree in the sense of it has to have balance, right? So if I want a figure to feel like they're standing, I have to have them balanced on the ground. And like basically, if, if an arm's going to thrust out this way, then a foot or something's going to have to thrust out the other way so to give them balance so that they're not just going to like lean to one side to the point where they're going to fall. It's the same with a tree. If this tree to not fall, if it's going to have a big mass that is really coming down this way, like on this tree here, then I'm going to have to have something over here that's going to have to balance it out. Now balance so that it doesn't just fall down onto the ground. And maybe sometimes that trunk actually came down onto the ground and kind of has a foot that comes down so that it balances and doesn't fall over. So that's true in people, it's also true in trees. And just visually, if I didn't have 
if I didn't have something over here, then it would start to feel weird. And it would start, you visually would need that weight to be able to, to weight it. So I'd, my tendency is to say, okay, I really do want something over here to balance that tree out. So both kind of big, medium, and small shapes are really important in a visual balance of design just compositionally, as well as just to be able to see um, structurally what's happening in a tree. So there's some thoughts about gesture. Let's talk very about good. Sorry? I said very nice. Awesome. So yeah, gesture, super important. If you were, uh, if you, so if you were doing that in a, uh, you, you were out doing a plein air study, mm -hmm. would, would you lay in those big shapes first? Absolutely. And I'm going to show, I'm going to do a demo of that just right after I finish the slide portion here. All right. Of what that means. So anchor points are really important. Um, it is um, super vital. Like there's a lot of things that can happen in, a, in painting a tree or a rock or anything really that can be kind of fudged and a lot of expressiveness. But where it meets into the ground carries unreason an unreasonable amount of or inordinate amount of information and importance. So for example, if I want this tree similar to the one over there, let's just go in a little bit larger. If I want this tree to feel like it's on a hill, I need to have that anchor point be on a hill, right? If I want it to feel like it's flat, then I'm gonna flatten it out. But where this person, where this tree touches the ground really is a huge amount of information on how, um, how this tree is sitting in the world. The same way that a figure's feet of how they kind of touch the ground are really vital. So anchor points are really, really key and something important to keep in mind. Here's some examples. Um, Tim Lawson, Scott Christensen, Josh Clare, three amazing painters. I could go on and on with other artists as well, but I want you to look at just how simplified they're painting these trees. They look so detailed, but they're really not. They're, the detail is in the basic structure. So we look at Tim's tree here, and really these are just some slightly scalloped basic cones, right? And most of them he's kind of shoving together so that they're called a shape welding sometimes or massing. So these are all just little bullet shaped trees that he's put over over the top of this and then given just enough of this shadow so that we know that there's a light side and a shadow side, right? Um, very little even cast shadow. There's a little bit of it, but he's brought the light around to where the light is, right? Like shining down onto, onto this scene here. And there's just enough of a shadow to get the point across. And with Josh's as well, look how simplified and scalloped these are. They're basically just big semicircles with the sides cut off and the energy is kind of pushing out, right? Josh is really known for his clouds and his trees. And one of the reasons, is why, reasons why is that a lot of his strokes are going out and even in his clouds, it's the same way. That energy is pushing out from that shape. And so it feels really exciting and just full of power. And, but really, when you look at it, it's pretty simplified. The same with Scott's. He's just kind of taken these big kind of rectangles. He's rounded them out on the sides a little bit, but it's just the, the detail is right along the edge. And this is a parenthetical thing that maybe it would be helpful to share. Texture is usually seen in two places. Texture is seen along the edge of a form, along the silhouette, and it is seen in the transition from light to shadow. If you'll notice in, sorry, it's kind of a, not a great resolution piece, but the inside of these, of these trees really are pretty flat. He's not, he's just taking this color 
and drawing a flat shape, I guarantee if you were there looking at this, that you would see a lot more information inside of that, those trees than what he's painting. But where he gets you is it'll say, great, I'm just going to give a really, a ton of kind of organic information right along this edge. And so because this edge itself is really has a lot of variety in it, then it doesn't matter what you put in here and this, these two, the light and the shadow can be pretty flat, yeah. but your mind is going to read it as textured, right? I noticed that studying the Hudson River School masters, uh, they do, they put a little bit more detail in, but essentially where, where the edges meet the sky or where the edges meet the contrast tends to be where they're putting the, you know, where it feels like a lot of detail. Exactly. Exactly. And it's one of the reasons why if you didn't do that, if you just went in and tried to paint every leaf and outline it and give a ton of contrast, it would feel wrong because we don't look at trees that way. We, we see the form generally. We don't see the leaves. And it's the same way that if you went in and, you know, when you're painting someone's portrait, again, if you, you know, paint their mouth and you outline every tooth, <laughs> it just feels really, really bad. Right. And so, like my teeth. <laughs> what's that? Nothing. I was just joking. Yeah. So it's the same way. Like if you go in and you outline every leaf and you try and say, oh, well, I know how to paint leaves so I can paint trees. It doesn't feel right. And it feels it feels just overly detailed and, and weird because we we just need to simplify things down. OK, so let's go to. Here are a couple just kind of some basic takeaways from this whole thing. So simplify tree shapes down to basic shapes. And then uh, once you've done that, remember that trees have a gesture, the same as figures. And to think about that gesture, really look for that gesture when you're on location. Say like, what kind of tree is it, of course? And then where where's the energy pushing from this tree? And how can I best describe that with a simplified shape? Trees are generally darker overall than you think. Um, you would be surprised if you just go and look through most of art history, you're gonna see the, the paintings that you're really drawn to that do trees well, they're generally darker than you think. So keep the tone dark and then also pull back on the contrast inside of the tree shapes. And to that, I mean, let's go back to these examples you'll notice that each of these, like Scott's showing a little bit of contrast because there's a really strong light and shadow, but even then he's not going black, black in those shadows and then white, white on the tree. The tree is still darker than whatever is going on behind it, right. at least in the sky. And it's the same with, with Josh, like he's pulling way back on the contrast. In clouds and in trees, if you look for contrast, you'll find it and you'll convince yourself it's it's there more than it is, right? Because if you look at a cloud, you'll say, well, look at the light and dark in the cloud. But then really you look at it compared to the rest of the scene. It's all, it's so, so subtle. Yeah. It's the same in trees. If you stare it up for long enough, you'll convince yourself that there is, you'll say, oh, I love this bright side. And you'll say, oh, you'll kind of confuse value for saturation and you'll start painting light there thinking, well, there's a light and a shadow in this tree. And then you'll end up really over rendering it. And it ends up feeling like the, the painted teeth on the figure. And it's just too much. Plus it starts to get too close to your, the value color of your sky and you just, it kind of falls apart. Hmm. So you really have to keep it subtle within the shape of the tree. Once you've established that shape, keep the contrast, as minimal as you can to still describe the effect of light on that tree. Um, okay, there's yeah, fabulous. And so we talked about that. We also talked about sky contrast or sky sky holes. We haven't talked about that a ton, but if you are going to put in sky holes, you need to usually darken them up more than you think and design them when you put them in. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in our demo section here in a second. Okay, are we ready for demo or do you want to talk about anything first? No, I think we should get to it because we're going to run out of time. Rock on. So we've got what, like about 15 minutes? Yeah, minutes? at least. Great. So I'm going to... 
I want to paint this tree right here. And I'm going to start with these circles right here. So when I talk about basic shape, this is what I mean. I'm going to take, I just did all these circles. And really what I've done is reproduced the shapes that I'm seeing in this tree in circles. So I want to start here and then show you how I would do this. Now, if I were painting traditionally instead of digitally, I wouldn't obviously just start with a big round circle. I would, but I would be thinking about it in my head. And so I'm just going to flatten all these down so that they're one big shape. And then I'm going to just change the color of them to match my reference. I'm just going to color pick right now so that I can um, keep as simple the variables as simple as possible. I'm not really even going to keep the different shapes of those circles for right now. I'm just going to do that. And then I'm going to start to give a little hint that there is some light and shadow inside of here. I'm just using a big texture brush the same way that if I was doing a traditional painting, maybe I would use just a ratty brush um, to get some different textures in there. Maybe I'll go even just a little bit darker in a few of those spots. Now, you remember how we talked about anchor points and where things hit into the ground that it's mm -hmm. really important. So I'm going to go here to my paint texture again. And I'm just going to chop that off where it meets into the ground. Right? Mm -hmm. So already, just from the color, from basic shapes and the color and texture, and then where it hits into that ground plane, it's starting to feel a little more like what I want. And so I'm going to just get this a little bit smaller there. And then once I have this, I'm going to remember the first three things I talked about that I showed in my, my little bit here was basic shape, texture, and edge variety. So I did my basic shape. I did my texture. So now I want to think a little bit about edge variety. And if I were laying this in in traditional paint, I would, I maybe wouldn't be this exact with my curves, but I would block it in in a really basic shape. And then at this, then I would start to just play with my edges a little bit. Even if I just keep these almost rounded and I'm just going to rough up the edge a little bit, this is where traditional paint actually has a lot more uh, benefit or you can do it a lot easier in traditional paint because if you were doing this with your brush, you could easily just go in and make organic shapes and use your finger and mess up the edge. So I'm just going to erase around this and just get a bit more fuzzy organic edge. And you say, okay, great. Like that already feels a little better because it's starting to be a little more organic. And then if, if I just stake that a little further, to start to mess up these edges a little bit more. But try and still maintain my general curve over that. Maybe I'm going to just start to give a little bit more variety. So simple. Right? But it's, yeah, I'm really just thinking of these as big circles, like fuzzy circles, but circles nonetheless. And it's already, it's already starting to feel better, right? So at this point, maybe I'll go in and just get a little bit. I like these other little guys here. And this is a good place to say that most trees have like a main mass and then little kind of satellite bits that, that fall off of it. And if you, if you ignore the main mass of the tree, then you're going to never be able to get it to feel like that tree again. So you really need to get those main masses in first and then the other kind of suggestion of the little bits, those can come. All right, I'll go a little bit bigger. So I'm just gonna throw a little bit in there. Maybe I would come in and 
just cut a few sky holes in. Remember we talked about sky holes and I said you need to design them. I kind of like how they're designed here, but I do want to say if I, let's say I don't have an eraser obviously in, in my traditional paint, I'd have to just use this color of the sky to come in and make sky holes. If I'm gonna do that, I've gotta understand the nature of contrast, right? That if I put a big sky hole right here, um, in the middle of this darkness, it's going to feel way brighter right there than it did when it was up here in the sky. Right. So I've got to understand that. I'm going to pull back on my brightness so that it's a little darker, and then I can put a little sky hole in there. Maybe not quite so saturated. And then it's going to start to feel a little better. So minimizing the contrast and designing them well as you're putting sky holes in can be really important. And then the only other thing I'd say about sky holes is you need much less than you think you do. If I were to go in and put sky holes all over this tree, then it would start to just feel like I, you know, I don't know, like a, a rural stop sign with shotgun pellets all over. <laughs> it doesn't feel like a tree anymore. Right. So I need to go in and just, just give enough to give the hint and you need less of it. It's similar to outlining the the mouth again and the, and the teeth. It just, David, if you were if you were doing a, a if you were doing a tree as your primary focal point, would you would you give it a little bit more detail or would you? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we're not done yet. Um, I would say. So let's say I want to go in and just get this guy. And maybe I'd start to throw in the hint of a little bit of, of some of these branches coming. I love, like you're seeing a little bit down in the reference, when you can get when you can get branches that are kind of light against the dark of the tree are super fun. And again, you need much less of it than you think to really give the illusion that you're wanting. And even with that, there's usually a main thrust, a main kind of branch, and then some little, some little bits. Here's a, an idea about color for trees. The deeper it gets into the shadow, generally the warmer it gets. So if you put, if I were to put blue, inside of this tree in the deep shadows it would start to feel really dead and just weird if i put red i can start to put in a little bit of warmth into some of those deep shadows and i don't know if how how visible that is within what you can see but i'll just overemphasize it if i put red inside of there mm -hmm it's going to feel a lot better. And one of the reasons is that you've got deep in these trees, you don't have photosynthesis happening much anymore because the sun can't penetrate down in there, right? So you're seeing more of dead branches and dirt and the insides of that the same way that if you, I don't know, it's kind of gruesome, but the deeper we go into a human body, the more it turns into like meat and tissue, right? We mm -hmm. don't have this papery thin kind of beautiful skin over the top. So it's the same with the earth, that that red right at the base and right underneath things is what makes things feel alive. And then we have this little thin veneer of, of beautiful vegetation over the top. So now let me say, what if I wanted to, what if I just did have like a filbert brush and I needed to just really think about structure of what's what's going on, I still can start to you know, vary my edge and give some hints of things. Along the way, I can keep my contrast a little more subtle if I want to. I always have to come back to that basic shape and whatever I put in of shadows and things need to really harken back to the basic shape that I wanted to establish in my gesture that I wanted to establish in the beginning. I 
And so it really is a lot of back and forth with, um, with edges and painting trees. Rarely do I just put down one stroke and that's it. It usually is just a combination of saying, okay, like how do I keep my circle feel and then give a whole bunch of variation inside of that to where it feels like there's a lot more going on than there actually is. Yeah, but so, don't lose that foundational structure. Yep. It's a lot of suggestion and on top of a very basic structure. And then you're going to start to feel like you're painting trees after that. Um, I know, I remember Scott Christensen telling me once that he always puts a few horizontal strokes over the top of his trees just to really pull back into the basic structure of what he's looking at, right? Hmm. Uh, so you have kind of a couple options, right? Like you can scrub towards the outside of the kind of energy of the tree and make your strokes be that way. Or you can do them all to be more structural. So you have like life force gesture versus structural strokes. And it's often a combination of those two that make it feel right. And then just a hint of little suggestion of things kind of, you know, bits of leaves that are kind of falling off, or not falling off, but they're kind of protruding out from the tree. It doesn't take a lot and you'll be surprised at how quickly things are going to start to feel like you want them to. And what happens if you have a backlit tree, you know, low sun, the sun is coming through the, the leaves. How do you deal with that? Because you've, now you've got a different scenario because you've got the, you, you, I would think you have more intense color, um, more of a stained glass window type of effect, but you've got to have it against the dark to really make it work. Right. How so do you deal with that? at that point, it's really just the same, the same idea, just the light direction changes. So different parts are getting lit, right? So let me take this and say, what if my ground plane is just a little bit darker? And what if my tree as a whole got just a little bit darker because I've got light coming from behind it? And then let's say that we've got, I don't know, this is going to look pretty gross for a second, but Uh, it's a surprisingly how just doing that makes a huge difference just by putting that warm sky in and a dark foreground. Totally. So a lot of it just is value of trying to understand what's going on with the value of, oh, let's say, and then at this point, if I change the temperature of this tree, to be cooler because it's catching a lot of the blue, especially if I put a little bit of uh, blue kind of fill light, make that a little bit darker. Or some of that, because it's getting some of the blue from the sky hitting the other way. So let's say then I take this shape and let's just lock that down. And let's say I have a really warm, a warm green. Hitting the edge of that. Use my texture brush just so that I can get a better feel for it. And yeah, then, you still have to keep it pretty dark against that sky. You do. It yeah. still reads like light. And if I want it to like be pushing out from some of these holes, then I can obviously 
start to warm up some of the edges of that. If it still feels too, you know, light, I can go darker with it. If I put in an occlusion shadow where it's darkening up as it kind of gets away and under this, even if I warm that up just a hair. And it's going to start to feel a little more like I want it to. But to your, to your question, it really is just about the value and then choosing, keeping the, basically rim lighting it like you'd rim light anything else and keeping the main mass really dark still. Right. Okay, there you go. There's the that magic. Fabulous. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't be. It's all, it's all wizardry. But um, yeah, I think we mentioned about a couple. Is this a good time to to plug promo stuff, or should we wait for that? Go for it. All right. So, two two things people might want to be aware of through AscensionAcademy.com. I just released a Photoshop for traditional painters course. And you can find that. I basically have really kind of broken down Photoshop and painting in Photoshop for people who are traditionally painting and want to use that as a tool. Just like you saw me just do a bunch of paintings. You can do that and then use that as your painting reference and use your paint over your photo reference. There's a lot of options there. So that's an option through Ascension Academy. And then Bella Muse Productions, I have a, a DVD there of composing through studies. And those are a couple of things to think about. Oh, terrific. And let, let me go ahead and put your website up so that we have that. And uh, you probably have access to all those things here at dibbleart.com. I'm going to take this other one out. That was fabulous. Well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. I'm excited you're, to see your tree painting. David, you're, yeah. Yeah, well, it may never see the light of day. We'll, we'll find <laughs> out. It, but it will be better now that I've had your your personal instruction. <laughs> Good. Well, it's an honor to be here with you and appreciate you taking the time to chat today. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Uh, you're a terrific teacher. I would encourage everybody to go to David's website, dibbleart.com. Check out his courses. Uh, if, if everything is as good as this, this last 15, 20, 30 minutes, it's going to be worth every penny. Absolutely. Yes. And, and by the way, it was worth every penny they paid for it today. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much and and merry christmas uh give those kids big hugs and uh i appreciate you being on today thank you eric